I've already been, I've already been ticketed twice this morning. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I, well, I come early, she comes late, uh, because, and we sort of meet right over here, and, and <clears throat> um, apparently I'm in some violation of the fashion code. And I poked the bear a little bit, and I said, uh, uh, and, and, it, and it was sort of like, you know, you're, you're running a stop light, and the, and the police comes up to your window, and, and, and you say, it's okay, isn't it? And, and I said, it's, you know, I, I'm, I look okay, don't I? And she goes, did you forget your shoes? <laughs> and then... Uh, I had a tap on the shoulder behind me just now, and uh, it said, seriously, dude, <laughs> a sport coat, you're raising the standards way too high around here. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I really didn't think it was that bad. I mean, black pants and, and a white shirt and a dark, I guess it's not black, but it's like navy blue, but I mean, for guys, that's close enough, right? <laughs> These are designer hikers, <laughs> Gail. Really, they are. And there's a black rubber bumper here that is meant to... So anyway, anyway, at least I didn't wear white... <laughs> I was going to change them out. <laughs> they were supposed to... With the white shirt, yeah. So I actually did all this for a reason, and I poked the bear for a reason to get a response because I know what it would be. And, and this is the reason, and I want to uh, uh, use someone to uh, make an analogy. So does anyone recognize this person? I was going to say anyone that gets his name right has got to be over 100 years old. I, I was going to say that. No, you're all are over, over 45 only. That is George Goebbels. So George Goebbels is an <coughs> old uh, comedian, and he was uh, a real <clears throat> blue-collar, uh, you know, j just <coughs> low-energy comedian that you'd have to laugh at. And he said something that I want to <coughs> use today, and there, there came a night that he was on a late-night talk show uh, the Tonight Show, and <clears throat> this is when late night talk shows were fun and funny. And on this particular night, uh, there was the host Johnny Carson. Uh, if you just leave it up there for a second, and there was uh, uh, Bob Hope, and there was Dean Martin, all all famous celebrities in their own right. And George was the last one to come out, and he. And there was a little banter, and then there was a pause uh, in the conversation, and George looked to his left at the famous Johnny Carson, and then he looked to his right uh, at the famous Bob Hope and the Dean Martin, and <clears throat> dripping uh, with insecurity, he said, he said, do you ever feel like the whole world is a tuxedo? and you're a pair of brown shoes. <laughs> it was just so good. It was just, you ever feel like the whole world is a tuxedo and you're a pair of brown shoes? Um, I wanted to use that as an analogy this morning. That's why you see me dress sort of frumpy. Uh, and I, I knew you'd get it. I didn't want to wear a tux and do this, but you get it. And uh, uh, so brown shoes, you know, they're out of place a little different, they don't really fit in. Um, the Apostle Paul had to feel like a pair of brown shoes wherever he went in his world. He was different. Out of place, didn't matter if he was in a city in Israel or he was on a mission trip, he always stuck out as being different. Not by how he looked, but because of what he believed and what he said about Jesus as Messiah, Savior, and Lord. And he paid for it. He said, five times I received 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I, 
I received a stoning, dangerous from robbers, dangerous from my own people, dangerous from Gentiles, dangerous from false brothers. He caused riots. He was thrown out of city gates. Paul paid a price for proclaiming the good news, but he was called to proclaim the good news to a world that he didn't fit into. No mystery. Jesus didn't fit into his world either. Uh, the, the, The apostle John starts his book out uh, the first chapter said that Jesus, he was in the world and the world was created through him, yet the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. By the way, then he, I, I, the next line is, is, is the good news. But to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. So we also are at odds with this world and different. Jesus' last teaching to his disciples was also for us uh, later on in John. And he said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. And then he continued on, and just a little later, and he prayed to the Father for them, the disciples, and for us. And he said, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but I'm praying that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. So when, <clears throat> when you and I bear the good news to a black tuxedo, good-looking, popular culture, we can find ourselves as that pair of plain old brown shoes, different, sticking out. Well, we've arrived at the last half of Acts 21, now in verse 17. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. So let's go to the, the, this narrative and then to the end of the chapter, and we're going to do it somewhat quickly to, to get at a couple things. First, there are some questions raised in this narrative about the law and the believer. I want to briefly address them, but I also want to introduce you to a particular Bible scholar and and teacher and do that briefly. And uh, the deeper part is in our going deeper questions that are at the Welcome Center. And then we're going to look at some of the settings that you may find yourselves as that pair of brown shoes uh, in your black tuxedo world. And then finally, I I want to look at uh, a valuable teaching to help us when we get into these kind of situations. So, as we read from last week, Paul was, Paul was plainly warned in the first part of chapter 21 by multiple people that trouble awaits him in Jerusalem. But being called by God, he goes there anyway. So, this is his third missionary trip, uh, and each time he reports back to Jerusalem and he gives a report. So, verse 17. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed us warmly. The following day, Paul went in with with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through through his ministry. So if you remember, they wanted to get to Jerusalem to to celebrate (coughs) Pentecost and the, the Jewish holiday. And here, day one, they were greeted by the Christian Brotherhood, the church, uh, and the next day by the elders. No disciples are mentioned here, so they probably weren't there, but James was there. James, this is probably the half-brother of Jesus, his Jesus' younger brother, uh, and notable leader of the church there. So, uh, and and this was the the habit of missionaries returning uh, to a reception with the Jerusalem church, we do the same thing here. And the city then would have been crowded with pilgrims and the church would be holding its <clears throat> solemn festival in that atmosphere. So verse 20, when they heard it, they glorified God and they said, see brothers, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed. If we could just stop right there, <laughs> if Paul could have just stopped right there, this is all good but we get a hint of something that's coming. And they are zealous for the law. That is great news about the Jews in Jerusalem and the believers, except many thousands are believing in Jesus, many thousands of these Jews, and they are zealous for the law. 
verse 21, but they have been informed about, about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses. He didn't tell them that. Telling them not to circumcise their children. He told the Gentiles they didn't have to, but he said nothing about the Jews or to live according to our customs. He didn't say that either. So these Jewish Christians still valued many of the Jewish laws and customs <clears throat> and heard bad, false rumors about Paul that they're believing uh, that he had essentially become anti-Jewish and, um, uh, and that he told Jewish Christians that it was wrong for them to continue in the Jewish laws and customs. So, so that's the setting with fellow believers. So it starts our first question. Why are these Jewish believers in Jesus still practicing and, and observing the law? Exactly what did the Jews who believed in Jesus believe? Should they have been leaving their circumcision and their law and their customs behind? Hold on to that thought. <clears throat> We're going to continue through the narrative. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you to do. Oh, the best laid plans. Here it comes. We have four men who've made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, and that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. With regard to the Gentiles who have believed, and this is something that they'd already decided in a previous trip, with regard to the Gentiles who had, have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, and from what's been strangled, and from sexual immorality. So, <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it's good that the Jerusalem elders were clear uh, what he was teaching the Gentiles, and they reinforced it in that last verse that we read. Eliot says this regarding this whole situation. He said, for they, uh, the Jewish believers, will hear that you've come. This can never be kept a secret. As soon as they hear it, they will flock in great numbers. They will come open-mouthed and be loud in their complaints, and it will be difficult to pacify them. There's danger. Uh, the consequences may be bad. Therefore, something must be done to remove the opinion that they formed about the apostles and the prejudice that they have entertained for you. So that's their plan, and Paul agrees. So the next day, Paul took men, having purified himself along with them. They entered the temple, announcing the completion of the, of the purification days when the offering would be made. So <clears throat> Paul joins in. He pays their expenses. He sponsors them. And, you know, Paul, if, you, if we go back to, to Acts 18, we find that Paul took a similar vow even then when he was uh, on his missionary trip. So this brings us to question number two. Why did Paul seemingly join in and seemingly also practice or observe the Jewish law? Why did Paul say this? Uh, why did he say yes to this? It, it, it certainly seems that he's going against what he taught. So that's question number two. Hold that thought as well. Verse 27. So when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple. You know, they almost made it. They almost made it. And they stirred up the crowd and they seized him shouting, fellow Israelites, help this man who teaches everyone, everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. He teaches everyone, everywhere against our people, the law, and this place. The people, he's accused of preaching against the Jewish people, the law, the law of Moses and all that that uh, encompasses, and this place, the temple and the city. Paul was not against any of those, but again, misunderstanding, suspicions, outright lies. The Jews should have been much more actually concerned about a little Jewish or a little Roman general named Titus who 13 years from where they are right now 
would surround the city of Jerusalem, would <clears throat> siege and sack the city of Jerusalem, would destroy the temple except for the eastern wall where you see the Wailing Wall today. Their whole system would be gone and they would be scattered and it would, wouldn't, the, the things that they were concerned that Paul was doing were going to happen. That was going to happen uh, just a few years from then. So the text continues, and what's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple has, and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with them, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was stirred up, and the people rushed together. They seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. It's like we've seen this movie before a couple places on his trips, haven't, haven't we? But this is in Jerusalem. <clears throat> By the way, we saw that name Trophimus a couple chapters back. We knew that he was on the journey uh, with Paul to, uh, to Jerusalem, but it, it, there's, there's no indication that Paul brought him into the temple. That was a major violation to bring, to bring a Gentile into the temple, even punishable by death that even the Romans w- wouldn't get in the way of. So as they were trying to kill him, the word went up to the commander of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. And so taking soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them and seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. <clears throat> you think, you know, today we talk in terms of response times. This was a really good response time. And there's a reason. Um, <clears throat> the Tower of Antonio, so the temple is on the left, you can see there. And... Um, Herod in, in 80 BC had, had uh, uh, reinforced or uh, remodeled the temple, but he'd also built this big garrison that you see here, enough uh, room for 500 Roman troops. So when the call went out, all that meant was that uh, uh, they heard the ruckus, someone yelled, the call literally did go to the garrison on the right, They ran down the steps and they'd be up to the court of the Gentiles and they'd be there at the temple uh, very, very quickly. So um, uh, we see Paul here obviously in big trouble. In verse 33, the commander approached, he took him into custody and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he'd done. Uh, and some of the crowds were shouting one thing and some the other thing. And since he was not able to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken to the barracks. And when Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of, of the violence of the crowd for the mass of people were yelling, get rid of him. And he was about to be brought into the barracks. And Paul said to the commander, am I allowed to say something? Uh, And he replied, you know how to speak Greek? Aren't you that Egyptian that started the revolt some years ago and led 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness? And Paul said, no, I'm a Jewish man from Tarsus Tarsus of Sicilia, a citizen of an important city. Now I ask you, let me speak to to uh, to the people. So the commander had a completely erroneous uh, idea of what was happening here. He thought he was this assassin, and Paul spoke Greek. Greek was the language of the educated, and uh, he wasn't a rabble rouser. Uh, And also he identified himself as being a Roman citizen. So that put everything on a completely different uh, uh, level, and Paul said, let me speak. And he did, and, and he gave permission. Paul st- stood up on the steps, and he motioned with his hand to the people, and there was a great hush, and he addressed them in their language, in Aramaic. So the commander probably did this because maybe I can get this settled right now. There seems to be a lot of confusion. Maybe this guy, maybe he can clear it up. So, 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 so that's our narrative. <clears throat> um, you know this is what Paul was willing to pay the price for. He's in that moment. He's on the steps. This is, this is the moment 
that he's been called, to, called for. And he had <clears throat> expected the chaos and, and whatever else would await him. And now this was his moment. And this moment, by the way, we'll have to wait till next week. So let, <clears throat> let's look back and just look at the questions <clears throat> that arose here. Why were these Jewish believers still practicing the law or observing the law? Well, <clears throat> keep in mind that in the book of Acts, they're still, still trying to sort this whole thing out. Uh, all they had was the Old Testament scriptures, and they knew the Messiah had come. They believed that, and they, un and they understand the forgiveness of sins, but there's all this other that, is be begun, you know, that, 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 that they've been involved with their whole lives. Paul has, was just starting to write his <clears throat> letters, and, uh, and he was very clear about all this. And so the Galatians, you know, he, he had already written just a few years before, for all who rely on the works of the law, and this is in your notes, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So we... we we, we've looked at some of those verses. And then he also said in Galatians, but the law then was our guardian until Christ, so that, until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. But it says that faith has come. We're no longer un, under a guardian, for through faith you are the sons of God in Jesus Christ. So Paul, Paul was very clear about this, especially with the Gentiles, but he's in Jerusalem with Jews. So why did Paul join in and pra also practice and observe the Jewish law? Well, <clears throat> obviously, Paul agreed to do this to demonstrate that he never taught Christians to forsake Moses nor to circumcise their children, nor that they were to ignore the Jewish customs as he had been accused by. Uh, Clark says this. He said, Paul had shown them that their ceremonies were useless but not destructive, that they were only dangerous when they depended upon them for salvation. Paul believed that he had the freedom to observe the law or not observe the law. But Paul simply rejected trust in any of these as a basis for righteousness before God, which comes through Jesus Christ. So why else did he do this? Well, he'd written a letter to the Corinthian church just a few years before. He said, I've made myself a slave to everyone in order to, everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. To win those without the law. To the weak, I become weak in order to win the weak. I become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means, save some. Dr. Richard Averbeck gives insight. He says, personally, on one hand, Paul, uh, he, Paul had no problem living as a Jew, observing the law. After all, he was a Jew, well-trained one at that. He found it spiritually fulfilling to live his Christian faith as a Jew, even to the point of engaging in Nazarite vows doing temple sacrifice, and so on. On, one hand, on the other hand, he was not bound to live like a Jew. He could give it up in a flash. God called him to preach the gospel, not only to the Jews, but also especially the gen to the Gentiles. I have, appreci I have appreciated Dr. Richard Averbach's teaching on this subject, and I'd, I'd like to introduce him to you in a short video. Um, these, are in, these videos are in the going deeper questions about the believer and the law. These are back there at the Welcome Center. But if you see his bio, I just wanted to let you see his bio here. Uh, <clears throat> so Old Testament and, and, and ministry at Dallas, departments at Dallas Theological Seminary, Grace Theological Seminary. He has been uh, most recently at Trinity as the director of doctoral programs in the, in the Department of Theology, and actually uh, just recently retired. Before we go to the cut, 
Averbeck. Averbeck. It sounds sort of like a German name, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound sort of like a Fond du Lac name? Sound like a Fond du Lac name? In fact, if you go to the end of our, of our lawn here where we quit cutting our lawn out here, there's a cornfield. We've got about an extra 10, 10, 10 uh, acres that we don't uh, mow. And we, we, it's in, we rent that out and it's, fa- it's farmed by the Averbeck family. In fact, if you go to Esterbrook Road right here and go by the cemetery and go north a half a mile where it dead ends, fly over that road uh, a mile and hit town lighter on to go up two miles is the Averbeck family farm. So is this the same Averbeck family? It is. <laughs> is there an Averbeck here in the auditorium? I'm looking and I is 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 she here? No, I'm not going to embarrass her then this morning. She has since uh, shortened her name to Flood. All right, we're starting to connect some dots. Starting to connect some dots. Uh, I was, Judy is our volunteer receptionist on a Thursday morning, and, I, and I'm playing a, a video, and I'm studying him, and I said, Judy, come in here. you got to see this guy that I and, I, and I, and I'd already connected the dots of who he was, and I didn't know this before, and I said, he's really good, and she comes in, and she, she says, oh, oh, Dick, that, Dick, that's just Dick, that's, that's just Dick, that's just Dick, well, it's, it's Dr. Averbeck, and he's pretty cool. So, uh, so this cut starts with a biography. I want you to get you know, want you to get to know him a little bit, and then his approach on the topic, uh, and his relationship with the Old Testament uh, law and the New Testament. There's a diagram in your sermon notes there, and uh, one of the ways he approaches explaining the context now and even back then is uh, through the covenants. And on that diagram, you'll see how the covenants flow into each other. Uh, There's a family covenant to Abraham, which flows into a covenant as that that, uh, family goes into a nation. Uh, That that family then has a king, and then that that family... uh, and nation and king line is all fulfilled in the new covenant with Jesus. So go ahead and play Dr. Averbeck. I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Uh, I started college at a university in River Falls, Wisconsin, commonly called Moo Yu. <laughs> it was the time of the Jesus movement. I heard the gospel and just plain lost interest in everything else. A month or two later, I heard that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. I didn't know anything about them. I'd never read the Bible to that point. So I heard the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek, so I assumed Christians learn Greek and Hebrew. So I found a school that taught Greek and Hebrew, and I went there. That's the way my life has gone. Yes, I came to know the Lord in, uh, in college. And uh, one thing led to the other, and I kept on uh, wanting to go into the foundations of our faith. And uh, that led to working in the languages, Hebrew and Greek, and then on to a you know seminary and Ph.D. and so on in this looking at the deeper foundations. And as I went forward in history, I kept forward in life. I I kept going back in history to the foundations of our faith. So I ended up working in the ancient world uh, in the context, uh, for the context of the Old Testament. At one point, uh, I was at a certain place in a seminary building, and I recall it occurring to me that maybe God wanted me to help the church with the Old Testament. And that has been my mission ever since. Uh, the covenant with Abraham is really a family covenant. He, he was just a man with a family, and big issue was having the seed, the posterity, and that's a big part of the Abraham narratives are about 
Isaac be born, okay, to be the seed. And so it was a it was really a family level covenant. Well, eventually that family grew into a nation that came out of Egypt. And so the Mosaic covenant is working out the Abrahamic promises for a nation now, which requires other kinds of things to regulate it, okay, including the law and the, the you know the commitments that God has made to us and that we make back to him, all of that. And so this was like a national level covenant as opposed to a family. But then that nation developed and at a certain point ended up having a king, Davidic king. And that's the Davidic covenant so that you have a family that grew into a nation that needed a king. And these are related to one another, these covenants. And then eventually the ultimate seed of that Davidic king, Jesus Christ, comes and dies for us and establishes the new covenant, as he says even in the upper room. This is the new covenant in my blood, in Luke 22, and other parallel passages. So what we have is this continuity of these covenants. And Galatians 3 actually makes it very clear that these covenants build. One covenant that comes later does not eliminate the previous. They build. And that is one of the main starting points for understanding how the law fits into the Bible and then how it can come through uh, into the new covenant community. So you can start to see maybe that uh, these Jewish believers in first century, uh, this was all a part of them, as he explained, as these covenants cascade into which uh, to, to one another. But it's their... It's their family, it's their nation, it's their laws, it's their holidays, it's their practices. Uh, and they still held out for a Davidic king, and uh, for, for the believers, they'd found him. Uh, so certainly they were still zealous for the law. So it gives you a little context to where they were coming from back then. So we can succinctly say, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but all of these concepts of identity and tradition uh, we're still being sorted out by them. So I do recommend you uh, taking a deeper dive with Dr. Averback and uh, in the going deeper questions in the back. So, <clears throat> so once again, uh, Paul is seen as a threat. Now he's in Jerusalem to religion, to culture, to the black tuxedo world. This time not as a pagan in a pagan town, but to his own people. What he believes has been recognized as so consequential as to change the very foundation of Jewish theology, how one receives forgiveness from a, from a holy God. But most of them were not thinking that deeply about <clears throat> it as being a fulfillment of a sacrificial law, but rather that he is throwing away everything uh, from the, the, their identity as a people to their food practices, their holy days or holidays, everything to, to the temple. What about us, in our gatherings, are we misunderstood and misaligned? Are we looked at as being different because of what we believe? At work, are you known for being one of those religious Christians? If you're in a public school or a college, I'll bet you're constantly sensing that you're a pair of brown shoes in a black tuxedo world because of what you believe and what people are probably erroneously thinking about you. Do you stand out in your family gatherings as that person because of what you believe? Are they erroneously assigning thoughts and ideas to you that are not true? Let me voice some of these common misconceptions that maybe you've heard said about you or you know are being said. You think you're better than us, don't you, because you go to church every Sunday. I've known people like you before. Christians are all hypocrites. You're a Christian, you hate gays, don't you? Those thoughts are 
far from the simplicity of the gospel, aren't they? So how do we handle these situations? Peter writes something that I thought I understood quite well. It's from 1 Peter 3.15, and and I always knew it from the NIV, and and it goes like this. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone that asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. Now, I don't know about you, but I've read this for years, and I thought I understood it because I understood it because it said, give an answer for the reason for the hope that is in you. It's such a nice softball question, isn't it? It's like T-ball, just tee it up. It's like, please, someone, just, uh, just ask me, you know. Ask me, you know, I, I, you're expecting them to say, well, you know, you're such a nice person and easygoing and uh, optimistic, you know. What makes you that way, you know? <sighs> it never happens. It never happens that way. That's not what this verse means. We swerved into this verse in our small group uh, study one night this year. We're going through the work, book Contagious Christian by Mark uh, Mick- Mickelberg. And it's one verse in this, in, in, in one word in this verse that changed it for me. And, and it's not the word, it shouldn't be translated the word answer. It should be translated the word defense that you're asked to give a defense for the hope that you have in you. Be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone that's, who asks you for the reason to the hope uh, that is in, in you. You're on the defense. So the context of this verse is that you've been challenged. It's not a softball question you're being asked. This is, this is a baseball, hardball, fastball, high and tight. You know, like the questions we've been, been like the three that I, that I gave as examples, let me just give a couple more. Look, you know, think about these challenges and how you'd answer them because you're going to be on the defense with these. How could a good God allow so much suffering? Is he really in control or does he just not care? If heaven really exists, why would God send good people to hell? What's the big deal? If you're good, more than bad, that's all that counts. There's many, many more. So let's look at this verse from Fresh Eyes, and let's look at it in your, uh, in your bulletin. And here's what it says. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. So don't fear them or be intimidated. Remember, you're going to get challenged here. Remember, you're going to be on the defense. It says don't fear them or be intimidated. But in your heart, regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready it, and be ready at any time to give a, there's that word, defense to anyone that asks you for the reason for the hope that is within you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who would disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. Now, do, do some of those verses make sense, or some of those questions, those challenge questions make sense? It tells you to expect those challenge questions and use them as an opportunity for witness. Don't be fearful or intimidated when you're hit with them. Don't be caught off guard. Be ready to give a defense. Uh, one helpful instruction that I think came from our study in our, in, in our small group was when you're hit with one of those questions, you could spend all day there. Don't answer it as best you can and clearly and then give the gospel. The critical mass here is to, is to witness, isn't it? So be, be ready to give an answer to different questions, but do it succinctly and briefly and get to the gospel. Get to, get to the reason that that hope is within you. Because when you, when you testify about that hope that's within you, it also says something about that question. There's always something in there in your witness about, you know, the, the reason that I feel like this is, of, uh, you know, I have that opinion. It's, it's this hope that's in me. On the going deeper questions, the back page developed a list of questions that you could be asked. 
because it's really saying here, be prepared ahead of time. Uh, I'd encourage you to take that, take that list and, and look at them and be prepared. There's also a place, an, a website that you can go to for answers about a lot of those things. So <clears throat> I encourage you to spend some time in that verse. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, by the way. Uh, uh, not only, it, you know, it, 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 this verse, it gives us our attitudes from start to finish. Don't be fearful or intimidated. And then it ends with do this with gentleness and reverence. Your attitude and your heart is as much a testimony as what you say. So <clears throat> let's wrap this up with this, that if you believe and can testify to by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you can witness to that, if you understand that, if that is your story, well, then you are a pair of black shoes or brown shoes in a black tuxedo world. And actually, actually the... Actually, the black tuxedo world looks pretty good. Actually, I'd like to be the black tuxedo world. My wife would like me to be that. But, uh, but God calls us to be that pair of brown working shoes, ready to be challenged and testify to the hope that's, that's in us. That's what he's calling us to. So next week, we'll see Paul rise up and he'll say, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. Same word. Listen to my defense. What about you? Are you ready to make your defense when you're called upon? Let's pray. Father, um, thank you for your word. Um, it is so revealing. And um, Help us to clearly understand, Lord, a, a verse like First Peter, and not only to understand it, Father, but to do it. Help us to be ready to be challenged, and then help us to testify about you, Father. Uh, so, Father, we, 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 our eyes are upon you, Father, and Father, help us to be a pair of brown shoes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.